All right, so it's time to learn what the iNotify property change interface is and how to use it. I'll first go over some theory and then we'll work with some code examples. Right, so the iNotify property change interface is used to notify binding targets that a property value has changed. What do I mean by that? Well, in order to fully implement the iNotify property change interface, you're going to need a source, which we'll talk about in just a second, as well as a target. And if you're somewhat new to the concept of data binding and whatnot, then I'm going to make the assumption that you have absolutely no idea what I'm currently talking about, which is fine. The target in our case is going to be the control, which we're targeting with the binding. So for instance, a text box and its text property. The source, or the source of origin, is going to be the data that it's bound to. For instance, a person model with members such as first name and last name. We're going to be focusing on two-way binding, meaning that the value we're setting in the text box is going to reflect on the member in the model and vice versa. All right, so first things first, go ahead and boot up Visual Studio, whichever version you're using. I'm currently using the 2022 version, the preview version, which is now available for download. Link will be in the description. Then you can go ahead and create a project. Go ahead and search for WPF and select the first one that pops up. Make sure that it says C Sharp. Windows and Desktop. Doesn't matter if you choose Core or not, not for this example. Go ahead and click Next, give it a name. I'm gonna give it INPC, short for iNotify Property Change. Next, and Create. Right, so the first things first. I like to click this button right here, which splits the screen vertically, giving my code on the right-hand side and my designer on the left-hand side. I just think it looks way better. And we're actually gonna start by adding a text box. A text box, there we go, self-close. We're also going to change this grid into a stack panel. Give it a width of, I don't know, 300. And underneath the text box, we're actually going to create a label as well. Because when we do the binding, we want to display the data in the label as well. Whichever data we type into the text box, that is. So the text that's going to be in here, let's type test for instance, that's going to reflect on the label as well. So the text property, or actually its content, should reflect whatever value is in here. That's the beauty of data binding. But we can remove that for now. And the text, we're actually going to be data binding. So uh, we can remove that as well. Right, let's go ahead and create a... Um, this is going to be our data context as well as our model. Usually we would have a view model separating that, but it's okay. Well, for, for now, we're just going to use the, the model as the, uh, the data context. So go ahead and create a new class. We'll call this person model like that and this is going to be a what's called a poco a plain old clr object just a fancy way of saying a model essentially we're going to be giving it a property type string named first name it's going to be a full property so type p-r-o-p-f-u-l-l prop full tab tab we're going to change int to string click tab to change the name underscore name tab again name there we go so you can see that the private field actually has a underscore and a lowercase letter in the beginning. That's just conventions. Now there's not a whole lot of things we're going to be doing with this as of right now. We're going to leave it as is. Just make sure that this property right here is public. Right, now let's head back into the designer. We can actually close that one then. Uh, this design window right here. I'm going to zoom out of here. And now we're going to set the data context. And I'll explain what that is as soon as we're done writing it. It's like one line of code. So underneath window, in between the stack panel and the window, we're going to type window.dataContext. Close that off. You can see that it's screaming at us because it expects something within. What we're going to do is we're going to type opening tag, person model. You can see for me, it pops up. I'm not entirely sure if it does that with Visual Studio 2019 or any other version. But if it doesn't, then just keep typing person model, self close. And you'll be able to hit Alt and Enter, and it's going to allow you to import the, the XML namespace. It's screaming saying that the namespace doesn't exist. All we got to do is rebuild the project by doing Control, Shift, and B. And you can see that it, the, the issues are gone. Right, so we now have a data context for an entire window. The data context is, well, the data that's within our person model, because that's what we're setting as the, the data context. Meaning that the, the data, the source of origin is going to be this class right here. So if we want to get a hold of the name property, we now can, because again, the, the data context has been set. Moving on. It is now time to implement the iNotify property change interface. And we're actually going to create an observable object as it's called, because 
this code that we'll be writing, we don't want to be writing, it's like five lines of code and it would really clutter up the majority of our models if we were to write that every single time. So why not just inherit from an object which already has the code implemented? That's going to make sense in just a sec. All right, so create a new item, add new class. We're going to call it observable object, just like that. Hit enter, clean this up a little bit. Right, so this is going to inherit from an interface. Uh, I notify, hence the I in I notify property changed. So we'll do do this. I notify property changed, just like that. We're going to hit alt and enter to prompt the IntelliSense list. And we're going to be using the system.component model. Here we go. As you can see, it added it right here. It's still being pretty mad at us because we haven't actually implemented the interface. We've just inherited from it. So we'll do alt enter again. I said alt enter again. There we go. Implement interface. You can see that it implemented the event handler. Now with Visual Studio 2022, it might actually be within .NET 6.0. It allows us to uh, create a nullable object because we will be null checking this either way. So just in case your, your snippet doesn't have the question mark here, that's fine. We can actually work without it because I'm pretty sure that the majority of people who are watching this won't have that. Anyways, now let's create the, the function, the public void on property changed. It's going to take a parameter and we're actually going to give it an attribute. So it's going to be caller member name. We'll talk about that in just a second. Alt enter to import that namespace. String property name equals null. And the curly braces. And here's here you can see that it actually asks us if we want to null check the property changed event handler, which yes, we will. Just not in that way. We're not going to be using an if statement. We're going to be doing property changed question mark dot invoke. That essentially null checks the property changed and we can just do invoke. Right, and this actually takes two parameters as well. The first being the sender, which is going to be this. We should be able to see this. Yeah, so the object sender is going to be this. It's this class that we're sending it from. And then the property changed event arg. So it's going to be new, oops, new property changed event args. There we go. And which also takes a parameter, of course, property name. Now, since I don't want to confuse too many people, what this is doing, it's going to be utilizing reflection in order to update the UI. However, this is all the code that you'll be needing for this class. And I'm going to be showing you how to use it now. Moving on, we can actually head over to the main window.saml. Right, so it's time to start actually binding data. So the text box has a text property, which we'll be binding to. We'll do binding and then we need to find, what's the first name? Was it name? Yeah, it was just name. So in order to bind, it's going to be, you know, the property within the quotation marks is going to be curly braces, binding, and then the property that we want to bind to, which if you remember, we created the property right here. Now, the binding works just fine. We can actually, we can actually test, test uh, this whole theory of the binding right now. So if we head into the person model, underneath the property, we type CTOR, which is short for constructor. And you don't need to write this. It could be a good idea in order to do some testing, but by all means, you can just sit back and relax if that's what you want to do. All right, so it's going to be task.run. There we go. Followed by that. There we go. And inside our newly spawned thread, which is chucked into the thread pool, we're going to have a while loop. It's going to be while true. Debug.write. Oh, I got to import that debug.write line it's gonna be uh just do something like that there we go perfect let's actually make it sleep for a little bit this is a terrible way of making the thread sleep but for testing purposes it'll be just fine so if i were to do this now if i were to run the application you can see that the name property is empty if i type something it's still gonna be empty it's not until this control loses focus we'll see the property update and i'll show you that so if i copy this text box paste it underneath here. We can actually remove the, the text because we're just going to be using it as a temporary mechanism to remove the focus from the original text box. So if I run this again, type something in here, you can see that nothing's updated until I do this. You can see that now the property is updated. And even if I remove this or type AAAA, you can see that it doesn't update until we change the, um, the focus to a different control. Now that's all because of the, uh, the update source trigger property, which defaults to the value default. 
which essentially means that the source updates only after the focus was lost on the control. In this case, well, our text box control. And obviously I just demonstrated this behavior right here. So the, if we want to see it update in real time, we got to change the update source trigger. This is just something good to know. So we're going to do uh, update source trigger. And we want to, instead of having it at default, which is default, we want to have it whenever the property changes. So if we do this, you see that there's nothing there. I type A. Oh, look, it's A. And like as soon as, like, I don't have to change the focus at all. It's, it changes as soon as I change that, which is what we're going to be utilizing whenever we, uh, whenever we bind the data here as well. Right, so here's the, the beauty of I notify property changed. If I were to bind, let's see, the, the content property right here. So binding to the same property as with the text box, we can see that when I run this application, and remember nothing changes until we, the, this control loses focus. Here we go. Notice how it updated the UI without me having to implement I notify property changed. This part right here is kind of crucial to know. Not a whole lot of people know this. As long as the data source that we're using when binding is a POCO, also known as plain old CLR object, the binding engine will try to subscribe to the property changed event through the property descriptor dot add value changed. I don't want to go too deep into this. Now, again, if you want a more detailed video explaining how it actually works under the hood, I would be more than happy to make a video on that. Now, here's where I notify property really starts to shine. Not only does it help prevent memory leaks and it's also not going to be super heavy on the reflection usage what it will do however is let you bind from code so it allows you so the thing that we just talked about it allows you to change or update the ui from the ui however if i were to change this value through code let's say within the model itself in the constructor it wouldn't update the ui it wouldn't propagate the changes to the ui let me demonstrate that so just for, for, for some data sake, if I were to do random r equals new, well, there we go. And then we were to change the, the name property. So name equals, we'll do r dot next, and we'll get a value between one and 1000 uh, to string. There we go. Here's the thing. These changes will update the actual property itself. It won't update the UI though. So let's check the output window real quick. It's going to set the first value, obviously, because that's going to be the default value. But you can see how the value changes, but the UI doesn't change. It doesn't matter if we lose focus or not. And here's where you'd want to implement something like I notify property changed. Now we already have our observable object. So let's inherit from that observable object. And let's just clean that up. There we go. And then on. OK, so I misspelled that. It should be on property change. Let's change that. Oops. We got to implement that. Here we go. OK, we can't. We can do it from here, which is fine. On property changed. Here we go. Head back into here. Now, check this out. So if we run this now, we can see that it changes. It's a bit slow, mainly because it's, it's working with a different thread. Actually, it's huh. I figured it would be slower because it was working from a different thread, but that's fine. All right. You can now see that it changes from the code as well, which previously wasn't possible. Now, if you've looked at tutorials prior to this one and you didn't understand, but you managed to get to the point where they actually implemented this, notice how some people actually specify explicitly the property name in here. We don't have to do that. Why? because we've called the attribute caller member name. And if we look at it, it says allows you to obtain the method or property name of the caller to the method. And if we head back, who's the caller? This property right here. And that's pretty much it. So a quick recap. You don't need to implement I notify property change if you intend to update the UI from the UI and the binding source is a plain old CLR object. If however, you do plan on changing the value from the code behind, then I would highly recommend you to implement I notify property changed. That's all for me. If you have any questions, make sure to leave a comment down below and I'll answer it as soon as I can. The source code for this project will be in my Patreon, which you will find in the description as well. That being said, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you sticking all the way till the end. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.